Hey guys, today I have something pretty special to show you. It's a hexadecimal encoded floor placer, and if you haven't seen the showcase video for it, I highly suggest watching that now. It is linked in the description below. This floor placer can take a pattern, give you the blocks for you to place in the correct order, and place them correctly in the world for you. This supports a continuous floor game tick placement, and is also Y0 compatible. The blocks are also only requested only when the player needs them so that it can work within a regular connection. It can encode up to 15 different block types per layer, and the demo version is sized for a 32x32 32 32 pattern, the size of which can be altered, which will be shown later in the video. This works for most blocks with some caveats. It does not work for slime, honey, non-sticky blocks, immovable blocks, redstone blocks, or observers. The machine also does not currently handle pistons, rails, and carpets, however some simple modifications can be made for it to do so. And finally, copper blocks must be either waxed or fully oxidized, as the process of oxidation can break the system. Before we go further, let me go over the credits. Special thanks to Bully for making the awesome pattern used in the demo today, as well as thank you to Upside Down Foxo for making the tool in which one can use to help take a pattern such as this and convert it into a usable ROM. Axcavator was the person that initially started this project. He came up with the idea to encode the pattern in a hexadecimal grid, early prototypes of a ROM, and how to determine how many times the pattern should repeat. He also was a main contributor to the hexadecimal encoded dropper line. As for myself, Floppy Donkey, I contributed most final versions of the components in the system, put it all together, and unless specified, I was the one who made it. Ali helped with early versions of the encoding logic, divided by zero, created the wonderful 4 game tick floor placer extension used, 1190 helped me to create the shulker box maker, Hexatron and Kaizen both contributed to the creation of the hex encoded dropper line, Boiding helped with early versions of the slimestone when we were trying to for a slightly different concept, and lastly, thank you to Hamster and Punchster, for although they didn't directly contribute to the floor placer, they were still involved with the design process. Now before I get into how to use the system, I'm going to briefly explain how the system works, and the inf how the information flows from part to part. First, we start with a ROM. This is where we have directly taken the pattern that we have chosen, and converted that into a form that we can use in the form of shulkers, filled to output different signal strengths. The sequential selector is used to determine which row that we are going to read at any given time. This causes the ROM to output to the side over to the two-way readable RAM of sorts. This then outputs its information in serial through the converging data line to the hexadecimal encoded dropper line, the item gun for short. This then converts the signal strength to item form, which is then output to the dropper line buffer, which feeds through the delay compensation dropper line Items are then directly requested from this line on detection from the 4 game tick direct player handling system. The player then places these blocks, which are then moved out to the slimestone portion, which organizes the blocks into place. Going back to the player handling system, every time a block is placed and then moved, it is detected and that sends a signal to the serialization length counter via Kaizen's instant line, which after the predetermined number of triggers pings the buffer dropper line, calls for another batch of blocks from the RAM, and pings the row repetition counter, which after it has been triggered enough times, will then ping the sequential selector, which causes the ROM to switch to the next row and the whole process repeats. Now as a note, what I just described is a very linear process, but in order for continuous 4 game tick placement to occur, many of these processes happen in parallel. To know how to use the system, we must first understand how the encoding is done a little. Let's look at this example over here. Here, Axivator took the lovely pattern that Bully made and played a matching game, selecting a different color shulker to re represent each block, which you can see here. For demonstration purposes, we have only put the most intricate layer into the demo system over there. Then all one has to do is assign each shulker color to have a certain fill level, so that it outputs the desired signal strength. This is an example here. This was all done by hand, quite easily, but in a bit, I will show you how to use the tool Foxo made to aid you in the encoding of your own pattern. Now, you may notice that 
the pattern that was encoded was only one-fourth of the total pattern. This is because we read the ROM in four directions. Left to right, right to left, closest to furthest, and finally farthest to closest, which gives us the result, as you see, of a 75% reduction in ROM size. This method of encoding also has the advantage that you can potentially build this very easily, simply from a picture. Also, for multi-layer patterns, the boxes can simply be swapped when doing the next layer. Now I'll showcase the automatic box maker. What this does is it takes empty bottles here, fills them to create unstackable water bottles, and then inputs them into a shulker till it reaches the desired signal strength. Let me demo. First, you input the empty bottles into the top chest here. Press this button to dispense the first block box. The system will then prime itself. Then all you have to do is take the desired shulker color, let's say white, input as many of them as you want to fill into this middle chest here. Let's go with nine for now. Then select the desired fill level. Let's go with one. And finally, click the note block. The system will then automatically fill the boxes and break them once they reach that desired signal strength. Let's take one and verify it. Excellent, it's signal strength one as desired. Let's just try one more quickly. I want three orange shulkers, and I want them to correspond to signal strength four. And voila, we have our new set of shulkers. Let's verify one more time. Beautiful, we have the correct signal strength of four. Now, let's move on to how to use the tool. First, you will want to take a blank ROM like what I have here. I used beacons as the placeholder block, which is the default block that the tool detects to determine where to place the shulkers. Take a schematic of the ROM. You don't have to be super accurate, just make sure that you have all the beacon locations. Save that in your schematics folder with a name that you will remember. Then take a schematic of that pattern that you want to convert and save that as well. Then open up Foxo's tool. First enter the folder path for where the schematics are located, then input the name of the ROM schematic, then the name of the pattern schematic, then input a name that you want the configured ROM schematic to be. Input the name of the placeholder block you used. If you are using beacons, just hit enter. And finally, the version of Lightmatica that you are using. After you press enter, it will process everything and output a schematic into your schematics folder. Simply open that up and paste that onto your Blake ROM. It even gives you a key on the side here for what each shulker represents. Now all that you have to do is assign whatever single strengths that you want to the boxes, easiest being just an ascending order from the printout key. But if you want to be more economical with how many bottles you use, you can also reorder things so that the most common blocks represent the lower signal strengths. Then, when you go to build it in survival, just refer to your key to determine which signal strength to fill each type of shulker to. Now that you have your ROM, there are a couple components that need to be configured. The 4 game tick floor placer extension must be lengthened to however big you want. However, you must work in full intervals of the pattern. For example, this pattern is a 32 by 32, so the length of each of these rows must be divisible by 32. So 32, 64, 96, 128, 28, etc. would all be valid. The points that you want to refer to to determine how big you have each row currently is this point here right before the piston and the space directly beside this slime block here. To expand this, just tile this 11 block section here as many times as you need. Then to end it, you add this section so that the blocks end precisely where you want them to be. Same thing for this direction. Just tile this 11 block section as far as you need. Tiling it one module longer than what you need is preferable so that you can guarantee there is enough wiring to complete your floor without having to put too much thought in. This portion is not as finicky, you don't need to, it to be as divisible by the pattern size at all. And to specify where you want it to end, simply place an immovable block three blocks ahead of where you want the last row to be. Or you can also just let it crash on its own, up to you. For this size ROM, 
you want to place 16 items total in the serialization length counter, one being in the stropper and the remainder in the other. For the row repetition counter, just take the number of items you want the pattern to repeat per row and multiply it by two. That's how many items you want to put in the stropper here. In this case, since I only want to print it once per row, it's just two. You also, of course, want to fill in the encoded dropper line with the appropriate blocks in their respective locations, corresponding with the signal strengths you have chosen for them. To start the sequential selector, simply flick this lever on, click this note block, and then turn the lever off. You will notice that the first row has now been selected and the ROM has now lit up. Now we are almost ready to begin making our floor. We must first prime the system. Make sure you have these three dummy blocks in place, and make sure there are 28 items in this hopper. Then press this button here. The system will then fill the dropper lines with items. Do not start placing anything yet. Wait for the system to shut down on its own after the hopper has finished transferring the items. Then turn on the system and place one dummy block. It will then give you the first block. Place that and the next three or four blocks, then go ahead and remove these dummy blocks. Now the system is finally ready to use and you may go back to placing. If you ever need to stop placing, simply do so and take the last item you were given and put it into this barrel for later. Then simply gently flick the lever off. Please don't spam that lever. When you want to resume, simply turn the lever back on. Take the block out of the barrel and once the piston has begun clocking again, begin placing. Now I will talk about accidental unloadings. When those happen, it can be unbelievably frustrating, especially with a very sensitive and interconnected system like this, where even one mistake can cause the outcome to be completely off and cost hours to repair. That is the main reason why we went for a physical ROM, because it is much more resistant to damage from an unload as opposed to a ROM that is inventory based. A physical ROM will not scramble itself, unless the chunk corrupts, in which case nothing would survive that. In case of an accidental unload, I would highly suggest taking a copy of the world and seeing what is wrong in creative. That will be much more effective than debugging in survival, as the tools available to you are much more powerful. I would then suggest to clear out the droppers and to take note of where the slimestone is. Make sure it is still operational as well. Then I would suggest simply to advance the slimestone by one and remove all the blocks that are currently in, in travel to the row. Guess that means you will need to finish placing that unfinished row by hand, but it is much simpler to do that than having to pinpoint exactly which state you need the logic back to. Of course, if you are comfortable enough with the system, you may do as you please. Then reset the ROM to its off state. We want to flush the ROM because we don't know if a tile tick could have been lost during the unload. Break this block, click this button, and wait for the ROM to stop changing state. Replace the block, press this button here, and repeat the sequence that you did to first initialize the sequential selector. Then slowly step the selector forward till it reaches the row that you want by clicking the note block. And finally, reset and make sure all of the logic is back to its initial state. Verify with a schematic if you can, and repeat priming the system, and with enough luck everything will be back to functional. Finally, as we get to the end of the video, I'd like to get into some specifics about a couple parts of the system that you will want to understand if you were to change the system or make your own. First, the buffer line is composed of three parts. The feeding line, which accepts the input from the encoded dropper line. The draining line, which feeds the player section. And the hoppers that connect the two. The reason for why two lines are needed is because the signal output from the ROM is in serial. And it doesn't stop till that portion of the pattern is complete. So when the hex encoded dropper line needs to push its items out, there needs to be space guaranteed for all the items to have their own dropper to preserve that order. Simultaneously, because I wanted the system to work for real players, it must request the blocks on detection. To have both things being able to happen when they need to, the two lines are used so that when the last block in that pattern has drained, 
the hoppers can quickly unlock and give the next pattern before the droppers would need to fire again. This guarantees space for the next sequence of blocks while keeping the player happy. There is another way to do this with drop droppers and with only one line, but I deemed it to have more disadvantages than benefits. The 4GameTech Direct Player Handler dispenses the items using a combination of detection and a synced clock. I clock the initial piston using a 4GameTech Zero Tick Gen because that gives me a consistency of interval while still being very good for real players even with a subcar connection. Then to deliver the items I have a dropper being clocked to fire one game tick after the piston over here has fired. Now even though this dropper is clocking constantly, it does not actually dispense items till the system detects that the player has placed the block. Done through the detection of the block stream moving. This ensures that items will never stack, which would throw off the overall pattern of the system, and also delivers the item to the player extremely quickly. This is achieved through using the fact that hoppers can push items the same game tick they are unlocked. Because hoppers can only act every 8 game ticks, I have a system that alternates instantly unlocking a hopper every time it is triggered. Then we come to the turner portion of the slimestone. This is the part of the system that gave me the most trouble simply because I was trying to be too smart with the system. Once I resolved myself to using a synced zero tick clock, it became relatively straightforward. This piston does not necessarily need to be zero ticked. However, that would create issues with how pistons schedule to extend, and the alternative becomes quite annoying. Zero ticking both the normal and sticky pistons allow for fast detection if the row is full, which is what I use to determine the endpoint of each row. In order to allow for continuous placement, one block needs to be moved forward with the turner. Because the block stream repeaters must be initialized very late, because of more scheduling issues when dealing with 4 game tick block streams. This is done by pushing over this slime structure. One could switch the clock zero tick gens to ones that work on detection. I made a system like that, but after asking various SMP players, the system was nicer to build, so it was chosen instead. The height of the slimestone can be changed. It can be moved up or down, depending on your needs, and if you want to place multiple layers, just make sure to adjust this piston here along with it so that everything stays in line. If you are happy with all that, and if you are fine with the 32x32 32 32 pattern, feel free to use the demo. However, if you want to change it so that the pattern is a different size, I'll go into that a little now. As for the ROM and the related circuits, it should be relatively straightforward to tile. Just pay attention to the endings of the sequential selector and the two-way read RAM. The line connecting the serialization counter to the row repetition counter and that to the sequential selector should keep the same delay as to make things easier on you. You can simply extend them using Kaizen's InstaWire if needed. As you tile the ROM larger or smaller, you will need to add or subtract comparators to the converging data line. That is fine. Just keep track of how many you added or removed. I suggest working in delay increments of 4 game ticks. Because for every four game ticks that you add or subtract, to that you must add or subtract a step in the delay compensation dropper line. The buffer dropper line must also be the same size as what the pattern row length in your ROM is. If your ROM is a 32 by 32, your buffer line must be that long as well. I have included a version like that with a more complicated bottom section already done for you. The top is very simple to extend, but I did that as well. If you need a size between 16 and 32, simply trim it to your needs. For sizes above 32, you are on your own, as a 32x32 32 32 ROM already produces a quite large 64x64 64 64 pattern. For lengths shorter than 16, it is very easy to adjust, simply cut off what you don't need. This repeater delay circuit must also be adjusted to the new relative delay. Adjust the amount of items in the serialization length counter equal to the size of the ROM putting the first item in the left dropper and the remainder in the right. Finally, adjust the number of items in the priming system hopper so that all items push to the front. Each item added will clock the system an extra two times. In the description will be this world download which contains the demo setup and also a three layer version for those who want to set up things ahead of time instead of simply replacing the shulkers when printing a multi-layered floor pattern. Now that's all I have for you today. 
Thank you all for watching, and I will see you guys next time.